Hey guys, it's Sharon. I know it is not the first Thursday of the month, so I'm sorry that this episode is a little bit later. The only reason it's a little bit later is because last month was a little bit later, so I thought it would have been too soon to have posted a new one. Either way, this video is one that happens every single month, once a month, at least until the year is up, and it is almost up. This is my second to last video of my Zodiac Serial Killers series. Maybe. I'm debating on making a 13th one, like a little special wrap up. But I'm not entirely sure if I should or not because I haven't thought that far ahead yet. <laughs> Either way, this is a video that I post every single month where I talk about a serial killer who corresponds with the zodiac sign of that given month. So for example, we are currently in Aquarius season, so today's video will be about an Aquarius serial killer. So if you want to see more videos like this, give us a thumbs up and let me know in the comments below. And make sure you follow my social media, including my Twitter, my TikTok, and my Instagram, so you have a say in my videos, get a chance to be in them, and also get to be shout out of the day. And if you'd like to see more videos, definitely make sure you are subscribed and that your post notifications are turned on and you can binge my Zodiac Serial Killers playlist to catch up on some episodes that you may have missed. I want to give you a warning. This is a sensitive topic. I am talking about a serial killer, so if this in any way, shape, or form it makes you uncomfortable, you do not have to watch this video. That being said, today's serial killer is Gary Ridgeway, also known as the Green River Killer. If that sounds familiar, I mentioned my Ted Bundy episode and you will soon find out. So Gary Ridgeway, also known as the Green River Killer, is an American serial killer was convicted for 49 separate murders. This makes him the second most prolific serial killer in United States history according to the most confirmed murders. His true murder count is suspected to be in the 80s. He killed teenage girls and women in the state of Washington during the 1980s and the 1990s. Gary Leon Ridgway was born on February 18th of 1949. He was born in Salt Lake City, Utah, and he was the second of three sons. His parents were named Mary and Thomas Ridgway. His father was a bus driver who would often complain about the presence of sex workers. His mother was a sales clerk. He grew up in what became SeaTac, Washington, and his home life was somewhat troubled. Relatives have described his mom as being somewhat domineering and claimed that while young, Gary witnessed multiple violent arguments between his parents. There is suspicion that Gary's mother sexually molested him, but Gary has denied it. Gary had a problem of wetting the bed until he was about 13, and his mother would wash his genitals after every accident. He later told defense psychologists that as an adolescent, he had conflicting feelings of anger and sexual attraction towards his mother. He even fantasized about killing her. He was not the favorite child. Instead, his older brother, Gregory, was. He was a year older and he was regarded as the most accomplished sibling. He ran for a student office and majored in physics at a reputable college. It's believed that this took a toll on Gary. And later, prosecutor Patty Eakes claimed that the only time Gary genuinely cried was when he talked about how scared he was to be put on the short bus. This was a bus specifically designed of transporting the mentally and physically disabled students at school. His classmates recalled Gary getting physically punished after minor offenses, coming from both parents with either a belt or a stick. Gary is dyslexic and was held back a year in high school. His IQ was recorded as being in the low 80s. When he was 16, he lured a six-year-old boy into the woods with the promise of building a fort. He stabbed the boy through his ribs into his liver. Luckily, the boy survived the attack. When asked why he did this, Ridgway simply said, I always wanted to know what it felt like to kill someone. Ridgway graduated from Taihe High School in 1969 at the age of 20. He married his 19-year-old high school girlfriend, Claudia Craig. He joined the United States Navy and went to Vietnam. Here he served on board a supply ship and saw combat. During his time in the military, Ridgway had frequent sexual intercourse with prostitutes. He actually contracted gonorrhea, and although he was angered by this, he still continued to have unprotected sex. His marriage ended within a year. He returned to the U.S. after two years and settled in the Seattle area. He worked as a truck painter, and he kept this job for a really long time. In 1973, he married his second wife. Her name was Marcia Winslow. He became religious during his second marriage, going door to door, reading the Bible aloud at work and at home, and insisting that his wife follow the strict teachings of their pastor. Ridgway would also frequently cry after sermons or while reading the Bible. Despite his beliefs, he continued to solicit sex workers and wanted his wife to have sex with him in public and inappropriate places, sometimes even in areas where his victims' bodies would be later discovered. Marcia and Gary had a child named Matthew who was born in 1975. This marriage lasted seven years and Marcia claimed that Gary even put her in a chokehold once. He didn't remarry again until 1988. According to women in his life, Ridgway had an insatiable sexual appetite. 
His three ex-wives and several ex-girlfriends reported that he demanded sex multiple times a day, often wanting to have sex in public areas or in the woods. Ridgway admitted to having a fixation with sex workers, with whom he had a love-hate relationship. He often complained about their presence in his neighborhood, but he also took advantage of their services regularly. Some have speculated that Ridgway was torn between his lust and his staunch religious beliefs. In 1980, Ridgway was arrested for supposedly choking a prostitute, although no charges were filed after he claimed that the woman bit him. Two years later, he was arrested for solicitation. Ridgway was believed to have begun his killing spree shortly after this. His first victim was thought to be 16-year-old Wendy Lee Caulfield. Wendy went missing after leaving her foster home on July 8th of 1982. Her body was found a week later on July 15th in the Green River. Two days after Wendy's disappearance, Gazelle Ann Lavorne disappeared. She was 17 years old and she was trying to earn enough money to move back home to California. She was trying to earn money through sex work. She got into Gary Ridgway's pickup truck and to her surprise saw an eight-year-old boy sitting next to Gary. He brought his son along. They reached a quiet, wooded spot and Gary told his son to stay in the car. He led Gazelle away from the road, paid her, and said he wanted to have sex. After they finished, Gary hissed, who's coming? And as Gazelle looked up, Gary clamped his arm around her throat and suffocated her. In the following days, he returned alone to have sex with her body. Later, he could not remember how many times he did this. Her body wasn't found until September 25th of 1982. By this time, Gary was already known as the Green River Killer. Now on July 25th of 1982, 23-year-old Deborah Bonner went missing. She was last seen at South 216th Street near the Three Bears Motel. This is the same intersection where two later victims were last seen. Both victims last being seen getting into a pickup truck. One was 23-year-old Gail Lynn Matthews, who disappeared on April 10th of 1983. The other was Marie Malavar, an 18-year-old who disappeared on April 30th of 1983. On August 1st of 1982, Marcia Chapman disappeared. She was a 31-year-old mother of three. She worked as a prostitute to earn money for her kids. Her remains were found on August 15th. Cynthia Hines was last seen on August 10th of 1982. She was working as a cook at a South Seattle barbecue restaurant. Five days later, a man looking for bottles in the Green River found her body beside victim Marcia Chapman. Both were strangled. Cynthia was only 17 years old. On August 12th of 1982, Opal Mills made a call from a payphone at about 1.30 p.m. in Angle Lake Park. Two to three hours later, her body was left on a bank on Green River. This was at about the same time police were moving Deborah Bonner's body from the river. Her last phone call had been to her brother Garrett and she was asking him for a ride. She was planning to do a painting job with her friend Cynthia Hines, a previous victim. Garrett had worked late the night before and was sleeping when he got the call so he asked if his sister could find another ride. Sadly he hasn't forgiven himself since. Three days later Opal's body was found near Cynthia Hines and Marcia Chapman. By August 15th five of the six victims so far have been found in the Green River. Gazelle was to be found in a wooden area later in September. From 1982 to 1984 Ridge Ridgway raped and killed more than 40 women, many of whom were prostitutes or runaways. After 1984, he committed several more murders, the last occurring in 1998. Ridgway is believed to have murdered at least 71 women in the Seattle and Tacoma area. In court statements, Ridgway later reported that he had killed so many that he had lost count. A majority of these did occur through 1982 and 1984, again, most being sex workers or runaways, and they were mainly picked up along the Pacific Highway South. Ridgway some sometimes showed these women a picture of his son and even had toys on his dashboard as a way to get them to trust him more. The only victim to have ever met his son though was Gazelle. Ridgway's MO or modus operandi was to engage in sexual activities with the victims and after minutes of intercourse from behind, Ridgway would wrap his forearm around the front of their necks and use the other arm to pull back as tightly as he could, strangling them. He killed most victims in his home, his truck, or a secluded area. Most of their bodies were dumped in wooded areas around the Green River, Seattle Tacoma International Airport, and other dump sites within South King County. There were also two confirmed and another two suspected victims found in Portland, Oregon. The bodies were often left in clusters, sometimes posed, usually nude, and Ridgway would sometimes return to the victims' bodies and have sexual intercourse with them. He later explained that he did not find necrophilia more satisfying, but having sex with the dead 
reduced his need to obtain a living victim and limited his exposure to being caught. Because most of the bodies were not discovered until only most of the skeleton remained, some victims are still unidentified. Ridgway occasionally contaminated the dump sites with gum, cigarettes, written materials belonging to others, and he even transported a few of victims' remains all the way to Portland, Oregon, just to confuse the police. In the early 1980s, the King County Sheriff's Office formed the Green River Task Force to investigate the murders. Task Force members included Robert Keppel and Dave Reicher, who periodically interviewed incarcerated serial killer Ted Bundy. This was in 1984. Bundy offered his opinions on the psychology, motivations, and behavior of the Green River Killer. He suggested that the killer was revisiting the dump sites to have sex with the bodies, which turned out to be true, and if police found a fresh grave, they should stake it out and wait for him to come back. Ridgway was arrested again in 1982 and in 2001 on charges relating to prostitution. He became a suspect in the Green River killings in 1983 only because of a previous victim's concerned loved ones. When Marie Malvar disappeared on April 30th of 1983, she was only 18 and had only just moved out of her parents' home. According to a search warrant, her boyfriend, Robert Woods, saw Marie get into a pickup truck at a bus stop near South 216th and Pacific Highway South. She was wearing a long black coat, a purple shirt, and blue jeans. The truck headed north, pulled into a motel parking lot, and then headed south. When it turned east on South 216th, Woods lost the trail. The next day, Marie's boyfriend and her father scoured the neighborhood searching for that truck. They found it parked in front of Gary Ridgeway's home in Des Moines, Washington. They contacted Des Moines police on May 4th of 1983. A Des Moines officer interviewed Ridgeway, who denied knowing Marie. This still led the Green River Task Force to focus on Ridgeway, despite it taking 18 more years before he would be charged in four of the Green River murders. After Marie disappeared, her parents searched areas frequented by prostitutes. They eventually had no choice but to give up. Her father was furious that the police did nothing, but in 1983, the tip without other evidence wasn't enough to make an arrest. Although her father's tip at least did prompt the police to take saliva samples from Gary Ridgeway on April 7th of 1987. As Marie's father waited for answers, Lewis County detectives were trying to determine if Gary Ridgeway was responsible for three other killings in their county. On August 12th, 1984, a year after Marie disappeared, 32-year-old Monica Anderson was found dead along the Chehalis River. She was last seen getting into a brown van on Commerce Street in Tacoma and was the first of the three victims whose bodies were found in Lewis County. Less than a year later, on May 5th of 1985, the body of 42-year-old Susan Kruger was found along a guardrail on Interstate 5. She was last seen two months earlier when she was leaving the Pierce County Jail. On August 5th of 1991, the body of 21-year-old Mignon Hensley was found along Highway 12. She was also last seen two months earlier when she was leaving the Deja Vu Dance Club on Pacific Highway South. This was in Federal Way and she was there to ask about a job as an exotic dancer. She was eight months pregnant when she died. Statewide, 151 cases of missing women had been forwarded to King County detectives. These are all from police agencies who suspected foul play. As of 2013, the three murders of Hensley, Kruger, and Anderson are still considered unsolved cold cases. Around 1985, Gary Ridgway began dating Judith Mawson. She became his third wife in 1988. Ridgway regularly attended a single parents group that was called Parents Without Partners. This is where he met Judith. Judith claimed in a 2010 television interview that when she moved into his house while they were dating, there was no carpet. Detectives later told her that he had probably wrapped a body in the carpet. In the same interview, she described how he would leave early for work, which she assumed was for overtime pay. He would also take double shifts. Judith speculated that he must have committed some of these murders while working these early or double shifts. She claimed that she had not suspected Ridgeway's crimes before she was contacted by authorities in 1987. She hadn't even heard of the Green River Killer at the time because she didn't watch the news. She said that Gary treated her like a newlywed. In a prison interview conducted by author Penny Moorhead, Gary said that while he was in the relationship with Judith, his kill rate went down and that he truly loved her. Of his 49 known victims, 
victims, only three were killed after he married Judith. Judith even told a local television reporter, I feel I have saved lives by being his wife and making him happy. She divorced him in 2002. Now the samples in 1987 were later subjected to DNA profiling. This provided the evidence for Gary's arrest warrant. On November 30th of 2001, Ridgeway was at the Kentworth Truck Factory, where he worked as a spray painter when police arrived to arrest him. He was arrested on suspicion of murdering four women nearly 20 years ago after first being identified as a potential suspect. DNA evidence conclusively linked semen left in the victims to the saliva swab taken by the police. The four victims named in the original indictment were Marcia Chapman, Cynthia Hines, Opal Mills, and Carol Ann Christensen. Three more victims, Wendy Caulfield, Deborah Bonner, and Deborah Estes, were added to the indictment after a forensic scientist identified microscopic spray paint spears as a specific brand and composition of paint used at the Kentworth factory. This was during the specific time frame that those victims were killed. Marcia, Cynthia, Opal, Wendy, and Deborah Bonner were all found in the Green River. Now, Carol Christensen was a 21-year-old mother separated from her husband. She had left the Barn Door Tavern on Pacific Avenue South after having lunch on May 3rd of 1983. This was the last time she was seen alive. She planned to return later for her evening shift as a waitress, as this was her second day on the job. Her remains were found six days later on Mother's Day, May 8th of 1983. She was found by a family hunting for mushrooms in a wooded section of Maple Valley. She was strangled and there was no sexual intercourse. It appeared her body had been ducked in water and reclothed backwards. She had one shoe on the wrong foot and the other shoe was nowhere to be found. She had a bag placed over her head and had raw sausage around her. There was a wine bottle in her hand and two cleaned fish lay across her chest, believed by some to symbolize the body and blood of Christ. There was also one stone placed inside her, common to the Green River killer victims. Deborah Estes was 15 years old. She ran away from home and was last seen on September 20th of 1982. She was seen along Pacific Highway South in Federal Way. This area is eight miles south of a strip of the highway near Seattle Tacoma Airport that was frequented by many of the victims. She was included on the Green River missing list on April 23rd of 1984. Her body was found on May 30th, 1988 in the 200 block of South 346th Street. Her identity was discovered on June 1st through dental records. She was Gary Ridgway's 40th victim. On November 5th of 2003, Ridgway entered a guilty plea to 48 charges of aggravated first degree murder as part of a plea bargain agreed to in June that would spare him execution in exchange for his cooperation in locating the remains of other victims and providing other details. In his statement, Ridgway explained that he had killed all his victims in King County, Washington, and that he had transported and dumped the remains of the two women near Port Portland to confuse police. The deal contained the name of 41 victims who would not be the subject of State versus Ridgeway if it were not for the plea agreement. King County prosecuting attorney Norm Mallon explained that his decision to make this deal was not a way to show Gary Ridgeway mercy, but instead that it was for the families who had suffered at his hands. If they stuck with just the seven counts, that's all they would have ever known. He said there would have been lingering doubts about the rest of these crimes. This agreement was the avenue to the truth. On December 18th of 2003, Judge Richard Jones sentenced Gary Ridgway to 48 life sentences with no possibility of parole and one life sentence to be served consecutively. He was also sentenced to an additional 10 years for tampering with evidence for each of the 48 victims, adding 480 years to his 48 life sentences. Gary Ridgway led prosecutors to three three bodies in 2003. On August 16th of that year, the remains of a six-year-old girl found near Enumclaw, Washington were announced as belonging to Pammy Annette Avet. She had been believed to have been a victim of the Green River Killer. The remains of Marie Malavar and April Butram were found in September of 2003. Pammy was last seen on October 26th of 1983 after leaving her home in Seattle. April Butram was 18 years old, last seen at a bus stop in the Rainer Valley between August 18th and September 1st, 1983. 
1993. The skull of another victim, Tracy Winston, who was 19 when she disappeared from Northgate Mall on September 12th of 1983, was found on November 20th of 2005. She was found by a man hiking in a wooded area near Highway 18 near Issaquah, southeast of Seattle. Issaquah is an infamous location for serial killer Ted Bundy. Although Tracy's body was found elsewhere without its skull in March of 1986, it was because of her skull that they were able to identify her. Ridgway confessed to more confirmed murders than any other American serial killer. Over a period of five months of police and prosecutor interviews, he confessed to 48 murders, 42 of which were on the police's list of probable victims of the Green River Killer. On February 9th, 2004, county prosecutors began to release the videotaped records of Ridgway's confessions. In one taped interview, he initially told investigators that he was responsible for the deaths of 65 women. In another taped interview with Reicher on December 31st of 2003, Ridgway claimed to have murdered 71 victims and confessed to having had sex with them before killing them, a detail which he did not reveal until after his sentencing. He acknowledged that he targeted prostitutes because they were easy to pick up and that he hated most of them. He confessed that he had sex with his victims' bodies after he murdered them, but claimed he began burying the later victims so that he could resist the urge to commit necrophilia. Ridgway later said that murdering young women was his career. When shown pictures, Gary Ridgway claimed that he didn't recognize the photos of his victims. He said, most of the time, I killed them the first time I met them, and I do not have a good memory for their faces. But he had perfect recall of of all the places that he dumped bodies. On December 21st of 2010, hikers near the West Valley Highway in Auburn, Washington, found a skull in the vicinity of where Marie Malvar's remains had been found in 2003. The skull was identified as belonging to Rebecca Becky Marrero, who was last seen leaving the Western Six Motel on December 3rd of 1982. The King County prosecutor confirmed that Ridgway would be formally charged with her murder on February 11th, 2011. On February 18th, 2011, he entered into a guilty plea for the murder of Rebecca, adding a 49th life sentence to his existing 48. Although Ridgway confessed to murdering Rebecca in his original plea bargain, but due to the insufficient evidence, the charges could not be filed. Therefore, there is no change in his current incarceration status. In June 2012, Sandra Denise Major was identified. She had a history of prostitution and was reported missing on Christmas Eve of 1982. She was last seen in Seattle entering a vehicle. Her remains were found at a known dump site for Green River victims. She was actually identified after a cousin of hers contacted the authorities after watching a documentary about the Green River Killer in April of 2012. Her identification was confirmed after DNA testing. Ridgway confessed to her murder 11 years before she was identified. In June of 2021, skeletal remains of a young female recovered on March 21st of 1984 were identified. She was found in a swamp behind a baseball field near the Seattle Tacoma International Airport. This was near the dump site of another Another victim, Cheryl Wims. Cheryl was 18, last seen on May 23rd of 1983. The newly identified victim was confirmed to be 14-year-old Wendy Stevens. Ridgway thought she was in her early 20s, but it was believed she was under 19 before being identified. For nearly 37 years, she was referred to as Jane Doe B10. She had died a year or more before being found in 1984. Ridgway claiming that she was killed between spring and summer of 1983. Wendy ran away from her parents' home in Denver, Colorado. Colorado in 1983. She is now believed to be Gary Ridgway's youngest victim. Two confirmed victims of the 49 total confirmed are still unidentified. They are referred to as Jane Doe B-17 and Jane Doe B-20. Both are believed to have been murdered during the first decade of Gary Ridgway's killing spree. Ridgway is suspected of, but not charged with, murdering the remaining six victims of the original list created by the Green River Killer Task Force. In each case, either Ridgway did not confess to the victim's deaths, or authorities have not been able to corroborate their suspicions with reliable evidence. Of the six, he denied killing Amina Agashev. She doesn't fit his age profile, nor was she a sex worker or a teenage runaway. He confessed to killing Casey Ann Lee in 1982 and left her body near a drive-in theater off of the Sea Tax Strip. Officials haven't been able to locate her remains. He identified a previous victim as Kelly K. McGinnis, but it was actually the remains of April Butram. Ridgway claimed he got them confused because they had similar physiques. 
He's also suspected in the deaths of Angela Marie Gertner and Tammy Lyles. Their bodies were discovered within a mile of the bodies of known victims, Shirley Sherrill and Denise Bush. Ridgway has been considered a suspect in the disappearances and murders of several other women, not attributed at the time to the Green River Killer. The list currently consists of six women, but no charges have been filed. Today, little is publicly known about Gary Ridgway. He is incarcerated at Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla, Washington. As of the day this video is being posted, on February 17th of 2022, Gary Ridgway is 72 years old. Tomorrow is his 73rd birthday. And that is all I have for you today on Gary Ridgway, also known as the Green River Killer. If you would like to learn more about Gary Ridgway, I do recommend watching this series on Netflix called Catching Killers. He is the first episode in season one. Now, I would like to hear your thoughts, concerns, whatever you are thinking or feeling. Make sure to let them all out in the comments below. If you do happen to have a request for a serial killer that you'd like me to cover, also make sure to let me know. We do have one more serial killer left for this Zodiac serial killer series, and that is the Pisces serial killer. And I do have one in mind, and he has been highly requested, but if you happen to have any others, let me know in the comments as well. I think the saddest part about this case was the fact that he was a potential suspect from the start. The fact that a victim's father and boyfriend were able to find the truck that took their daughter girlfriend and she disappeared and it was a truck parked at Gary Ridgeway, the serial killer's house, blows my mind. Police really could have had them had they just paid more attention to victims and had they just, I don't want to say done a better job, but done a better job, which is sadly the case for a lot of these serial killer cases, but what can you do? Now, shout out of the day goes to Norma on Instagram. Thank you so, so much. If you would like to be shout out of the day, just follow me on my Instagram and stay active. Like I mentioned, this is a series that I post a new episode for every single month, usually the first Thursday of the month, but we've been a little behind ever since Vlogmas, so you can expect it on a Thursday in the month, and I do post an episode for every serial killer that coincides with the zodiac sign of that month, so since next month is Pisces, we're doing a Pisces serial killer, and that is actually going to be the last episode of this series depending if I decide on making a 13th one or not, which to be honest, I'm debating on making it about the Zodiac Killer, but I feel like there's also just so much stuff out there about the Zodiac Killer. So I don't know, you tell me, you let me know, but other than that, make sure you're subscribed and your post notifications are turned on and I will see you next month with a new episode and next time with a new video. Bye.